Good morning. Welcome each of you here this morning. How about we open with a word of prayer? God, thank you for today, and thank you for the opportunity to come together with a family of believers, and um, I just pray this morning that you could be glorified throughout this service. I pray against any attempts the devil may have to distract, distract or disrupt, and I pray that your presence would fill this place. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so jumping ahead to Luke 11 now, I think we're almost halfway through Luke, believe it or not. Uh, no, I'm, I think it's going good, but this morning I've titled it, Teach Us to Pray. I'm not going to have you stand for the verses because it's such a short amount of verses, so I'm sure you guys are upset about that. Um, go ahead and turn to Luke 11, we'll read verses 1 through 4. One day in a place where Jesus had just finished praying, one of his disciples requested, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus told them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. So we find Jesus in a certain place, praying. This has become a very common sight for the disciples, I'm sure, and even for us, because up to this point here in Luke 11, there's a number of instances where we've been told that Jesus is praying. In Luke 3.21, Jesus prayed after his baptism. In 5.16, it says he often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. In 6.12, he went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed all night. This would have been the night before he picked his 12 disciples. In 9.18, Jesus left the crowds to pray. In 9.28, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain to pray. And in 10.21 through 22, it says Jesus prays a prayer of thanksgiving. And now here in Luke 11, we find him praying again. Jesus prioritized prayer. And I think this first verse, as simple as it may be, tells us a lot about Jesus' prayer life and the significance of prayer in his life and what it showed the disciples. The disciples have seen a powerful connection between Jesus and God because of his prayer life. And they recognize that prayer is one of the main components that keeps Jesus pressing on, that keeps him focused. I can imagine how often the disciples woke up in the morning, oh, where's, where's Jesus? And I'm sure by chapter 11, they know exactly where he's at. Where's Jesus? And they have to go find him. Maybe it's by a tree. Maybe it's in the wilderness. Maybe it's up on a mountain. Because Jesus often withdrew to pray. Perhaps when they found him, they just waited a little ways off, far enough to not interrupt him, but close enough to hear him pray. And I wonder what that was like. What did Jesus praying to his father sound like? How did it differ from how we maybe pray today? So perhaps today is one of those situations. They found him in a certain place. They hear him. He's finishing up his prayer. And when he's all finished, one of them says, teach us to pray. This request tells us something significant. These disciples are the elite 12. Out of all of the followers that have been following Jesus, Jesus picked these 12 guys to follow him. They had been given power. We've seen this. They had been given power to heal sickness. They had been given power, authority over demons. And if we would hear about these guys today, I'm sure we'd be like, wow, those guys are on track. And if we were one of them, we'd probably feel pretty good about ourselves, like, wow, we have this relationship with Jesus that's so incredible, that's even 
more incredible than what these other hundreds of people who are following Jesus. But they see something in prayer so significant that they feel like they're missing out on something. We might be content with their place, but they weren't content with where they were at. And so I think that's why this verse tells us way more than a disciple just wanting to hear or to learn how to pray. This is telling us they're seeing something incredible at work here. I think that Jesus prayed to keep himself aligned, and we're going to look at this a little bit later, to keep himself aligned with God and his will. When Jesus prayed, it was preparation for the day. It prepared him for the people that he was going to run into that day. It prepared him for the instances, the happenings, whatever. It prepared him for all of that. Have you ever noticed how it doesn't seem like Jesus is often caught off guard or surprised? He was prepared for it because he just knew whatever happened was God's will. It was God's plan for him for that day. So aside from the relational aspect of prayer between father and son, I think these might be some of the reasons why the disciples were so inspired by his prayer life. So Jesus responds, this is how you should pray. And then he gives them an example of prayer. And this example of prayer is an idea of the content of what prayer should be. Um, So I just want to clarify a little bit something here. If you noticed, the verses don't quite sound like the Lord's Prayer. When you read Luke's version, it sounds a little bit different. So the version I read from is the Berean Study Bible. If you read the King James Version or the New King James Version, you're not going to see a difference between this prayer and Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount when he prays. This is the difference. So this is from Matthew 6, and the stuff that's highlighted is what we read here today in Luke. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Familiar. That's what we know. Today, we read, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation. Maybe not quite word for word with what Luke said, but, so I say all this, not to be hard on a version of the Bible or anything, but just to clarify the difference here, it looks like the King James Version authors copied and pasted from Matthew 6, and put it in Luke 6. So I point all this out to bring us to a really big rabbit trail. But I do think that it's something good for us to address. It applies to the differences that we see in the Bible. I'm sure if you've spent any time in the Bible, you see something and you're like, wait a minute, is this the same story? Or this is worded a little bit differently. There are people out there who look at every instance like this and will try to discredit the Bible because it doesn't quite match up. Why do things sometimes not quite line up in the Bible? Especially from one gospel to another. When you read the gospels, you sometimes you see this a little bit more often. So I'm going to go through several reasons of why we might see some of these differences. So first of all, we tend to read the Bible, especially the Gospels, as this timeline. Boom, 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 boom. Things have to be in order. And the thing we forget is that these are four books, letters, whatever you want to call them, written by four different people. Each of their letters, I believe, were inspired by God. And there is overlap. We see that. But they were human, just like you and me. And I think that certain things stuck out to Matthew differently than they did to Luke, or vice versa. Matthew wrote the Sermon on the Mount. Luke wrote the Sermon on the Plain. Lots of people will say they're one and the same. Other people will say they're something separate. 
it's not something really that we need to get hung up on because there is similar teaching, but it is important to know that it's possible that just because it says the same thing, they're different situations. So the first reason for differences can simply be that it was actually a different event, or maybe it was the same event told through the mouth, through the eyes, the hearing of a different person. So building off of that, the second reason for differences can just be the simplicity of Jesus' gospel, of of his teaching, sorry, and the repetition that would have resulted from that simplicity. I've been preaching for three years now, and I can guarantee you, if you go back through my message and if you would listen to each one, you would find many times where I said the same thing or a very similar thing. This does not mean that I preached it all in one message, right? I'm standing up here today. I stood up here a few weeks ago. It's different things, but I might say the same thing. And and a little plug here. Sold Out is coming up here in April. Uh, Sorry, I just lost my place. Sold Out is coming up here in April. Rick is going to be teaching at a youth conference. And he does this about six to eight times a year, and he preaches the same four messages each time. In fact, he's already told us, not for this year, but in the past, this session is going to take me this long. Down almost to the minute, he can tell you. Does that mean that when he preaches in Pennsylvania, Indiana, Oregon, Canada, wherever, these six to eight youth conferences, well, he said the same thing, they're all one event. No, it doesn't. How much more so, Jesus preaching a simple message that sometimes is hard to get a hold of over the course of three years, how much more likely is it that he's going to repeat himself, that he's going to say something different? In a different scenario, he's going to say it just a little bit differently. He's going to say it this way or that way. This leads us to the third difference. It can be dependent on scenarios. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching to a multitude of people, we're told. Here in Luke, it's just his disciples, the way it sounds like. So, his response could be a little bit different than what we see in Matthew 6. The prayer is different. His comments after are different. Jason and I come up here and preach a message to you in 30, 45 minutes, however long it takes us, and we do our best to communicate that message to you. Now, if Dwayne comes up to me and asks me a question, I may say something differently to him as an individual or to my care group than what I would say up here. It's not because, oh, I'm preaching one thing, living a neck, another thing. No, it's a different scenario. It's different application. I may be able to expound more in my care group than what I can here. Or to Dwayne, I may be able to go into more detail than what I can right here. It doesn't mean that suddenly we have a problem here. And one final reason for differences And I believe this is specific to this situation. Jesus taught that repetition, and we're going to look at this in part two. Jesus taught that repetition is not the way to pray. So if he taught that, why would he teach the exact same words every time someone asked him, teach me to pray? He wouldn't do that. That's because his purpose here is not to teach you exactly word for word verbatim of how to pray. He wants to teach us the content of our prayer. Does that make sense? So that brings us all the way around. Long rabbit trail. Everyone's lost now. Don't even remember what the message is. That brings us back to where we were. Jesus is using an example of prayer to teach us the content of the prayer. All right, so let's get into it. So verse 2. So Jesus told them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Interesting thing about these two phrases is that we are praying for God. We are praying for something for God. 
We aren't praying for us. We aren't praying for something for us. We're praying for God. The first phrase, Father, hallowed be your name. The word hallowed means respected, honored, and kept holy. And the word name is referencing God's reputation and his character. So it's like we're saying, God, we pray that your reputation and your character would be respected, honored, and kept holy. So, even though we're praying for something for God, this brings us a bunch of responsibility because we are the ones that represent God's kingdom. As a Christian, we represent God and his kingdom. So, when we do things the way the world does things, when we react the way the world reacts to something, we're not doing a good job of representing God and his kingdom. And so that brings us to, unfortunately, the fact that sometimes, while we want to bring him respect, we can damage his name. We can damage his character. Does anyone remember in the Truth Project, Del Tackett's thing, the you know, they interviewed a bunch of people. This was a Sunday school for those who weren't here for Sunday school. This was a Sunday school thing we did like two years ago. There was a man, I can't remember his name. All I can think of is Spike. Does anyone remember his name? He was a tattoo artist. Do you remember his name? I want to say Spike, but I don't think that's right. So they interview all these people and you get their different opinions and things. When he was asked about church... His demeanor changed like that. He used language that they beeped out. He was upset. Why? Because someone, a church or a Christian, damaged the name of God. It is possible for us to do that. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, when we pray for uh, let us be witnesses in the neighborhood, help me to show Jesus, those are our requests to lift up God and his character. And if we handle things the wrong way and someone knows they go to that church, they're a Christian, what do we do? We damage the name of God. So this, even though we're praying for God, brings a big responsibility on us. We make requests like, hallowed be your name, like, Help me to be a good witness. Help us to be lights in our community. We make those requests out of our desire to bring God glory. The next phrase, your kingdom come, means it's God's kingdom or God's rule, which encompasses his plan, his agenda, his will. Again, we're praying for something for God. We're praying that his kingdom is prioritized. And again, this brings responsibility to us. Often it's our name, it's our reputation, It's our kingdom, our plan, our agenda, our will that we prioritize and we protect over your kingdom come. But these first two verses are teaching us, or these these first two phrases, sorry, are teaching us we need to resist that tendency of promoting ourselves, protecting ourselves, and rather promote God's name and his kingdom. So prayer isn't about getting what we want from God. It's about us being a part of accomplishing God's will. In Matthew 6, the version of prayer, it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Imagine God's will being done through us the way it's done through the angels. We would have a pretty amazing community here, I think. It would be an amazing sight to see from the outside. Those guys are so sold out. They prioritize God above everything else. They'll lay down their schedule, their plans, their name, all for God. Even if it's embarrassing for them, they lay down their name for God. Do we seek what God wants over what we want? Are we willing to accept God's rule over our lives? It's the kind of attitude the Samaritan had. Coming along, he has his his day planned. Oh, nope, something changes. When God presents an opportunity, are we willing to sacrifice our time, perhaps our money? Are we willing to allow him to rule in that moment of time? Or do we prioritize our kingdom and our plan over his? Ben Shapiro 
put a post on Facebook this past week, I think it was. And this is what it says. Lehit palel, I think I'm pronouncing that right, is the Hebrew verb for to pray. It uses the reflexive tense, meaning it's supposed to apply back to you. When you pray, you're addressing God. However, what you're really doing is changing your orientation towards God, praying that he can change yourself to do God's will. Every day, you have the chance to be a new person. Prayer is what helps you reorient yourself toward God to become that new person. It's a mistake to think that prayer is supposed to be some constant divine experience and connection every day. If that is what you're seeking in prayer, you may often come up short. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, if you don't feel that connection, it does not absolve you of the necessity to pray. I'm going to pause right here because some of you may not have liked that comment, that paragraph. It's a mistake to think that prayer is supposed to be some constant divine experience and connection. What he's trying to say is not that it doesn't happen that way, but how many of us struggle with our prayer life daily because sometimes it just feels like a drag. Don't expect this revelation every single day of something to happen because if you do that, you're going to end up giving up. And C.S. Lewis says, if you don't feel that connection, it does not absolve you of the necessity to pray. So he's trying to say, don't get your hopes up and then be disappointed when it comes up short. The important thing is to pray. So he continues, in Judaism, we pray three times a day. Muslims pray five times a day. Catholics and Protestants pray throughout the day as well. The ritualization of prayer is meant to reorient yourself toward God on a consistent basis and change you. So I looked up that Hebrew word, and it is the word for prayer, but it literally translates to judge yourself. And there was a comment along with the definition said, prayer is more than asking God for things, more than even a conversation with God. It is judging yourself to see where you need to improve and aligning yourself and your will with God. I love that. I'm going to read that again. Prayer is more than asking God for things, more than even a conversation with God. It is judging yourself to see where you need to improve and aligning yourself and your will with God. That's how we look at prayer. That's our attitude in prayer. And I think that is what Jesus is pointing out here in these first two phrases. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom kingdom come. All of this is prioritized over me and what I want. I want to be aligned with your will and your plan. But prayer is also about asking God for things, as we see in the next verse. Give us each day our daily bread. So there have been people in the past who don't really like this phrase because surely Jesus wasn't just talking about food. So they've tried to spiritualize it and they come up with things like communion or Jesus as the bread of life or the word of God as our daily bread. In response to all these attempts to spiritualize the word bread, one man said, this is exceedingly absurd. That's all he said. So whether you want to believe it or not, this word bread is literally bread. We try to convince ourselves maybe that God doesn't care for our daily needs, but he in fact does. That is what Jesus is trying to present here. He does care for our needs. There's no hidden meaning behind it. We ask God to give us what we need each day. Maybe it is food. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's patience to deal with the children. Maybe it's courage to face that coworker. Whatever it may be, that day... We can pray for it because God cares for our daily needs. Our attitude in this comes from faith that God will provide exactly what we need for the day. But notice that Jesus does not teach them to pray for excess, but to pray and trust God to give us what is needed for each day. We don't pray for a pantry full of bread. We pray for what we need that day. 
We pray for our needs, not our greeds. In Exodus 16, we read of the manna that God provided for the Israelites while they were in the wilderness. And he asked them, only take what's necessary for the day. And I forget what the measurement was, but he said, this much per person. Only take what's necessary per person for the day. And then on the sixth day, they could gather, I believe, twice as much so that the seventh day they could rest. So he wanted them to trust that he's going to provide this manna each and every morning. And he did. But like us, it wasn't easy for the Israelites to just fall on that, on what he said. Some of them gathered up some extra manna to save up for the next day. Well, by morning, it stank and was full of maggots. God cares about our everyday needs. And it's okay to pray about them. Pray about them. Do we trust him to take care of them? Or is today spent worrying about our needs tomorrow? And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. So as important as food is for each day, now we come to forgiveness. And forgiveness is just as important, more important than the food we need each and every day. We often throughout the day will get hungry, right? Our stomach will growl. I'm like, oh, got to find some food. Forgiveness, sometimes we don't feel the need for. But it is needed, whether we feel it or not. And the assumption is, for the last part, is that we recognize the significance of God's forgiveness to us, and that enables us to forgive those who need to be forgiven. Is it possible for us to pray the way Jesus is teaching here and refuse to forgive someone for what they've done to us? Unforgiveness wrecks people, relationships. It destroys friendships, marriages, churches, families. Is it possible for us to be walking this journey with Christ to pray on a daily basis and yet choose not to forgive someone for what they've done to us? How can we ask to be forgiven if we're going to hold grudges and are bitter towards those who we should be forgiving? God's gift of forgiveness enables us to do something that I don't believe we could do on our own strength. At least not to the extent that a Christian forgives. How easy is it for you to forgive others? Perhaps there are people you can think of now that need to be forgiven. Will you do it? And lead us not into temptation. This phrase initially may be like, wait a minute, can God do that? Can he lead us into temptation? James 1.13 says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Okay, so if God can't tempt us, why would Jesus say this? This idea is not focusing on what God cannot do, but what he can do. Psalm 5.8 says, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Psalm 139.24 says, lead me in the way everlasting. God cannot tempt us, but he can lead us away from temptation. So imagine it like this. I take my family to the store. We walk down the aisles. There's the candy aisle. Now, I can take my family, my children, down the candy aisle and as parents, we all know how that's going to go. We're going to, the greed's going to show up. The whining, the pouting, the begging, all of that is going to show up as we walk down the candy aisle. I can walk further and find the toy aisle, and the exact same thing is going to happen. Or, if I'm wise, I pass by that aisle, and I lead my children away from that. So when we pray this, we are asking God, don't take us down the toy aisle today. Lead us away from that. We're recognizing that our flesh wants to grab that toy, wants to grab that bag of candy, all the things that are not good for us, and we're praying, God, lead us away from that today. All right? 
He cannot tempt you. That's what this is about, leading us away. He can lead us away. Now, if we pray this and then we run down the toy aisle, that's on us. Can't blame God. Don't have a fallback. Your fault for running down the toy aisle. When we genuinely pray this, this, it's going to live out in several ways. First of all, we're not going to boast or trust in our own strength. It's amazing how many people think they can handle temptation. It's not the case. The Bible warns against it. You have that idea that, oh, I'm in this situation all the time. I can handle it. Oh, this situation won't. No. (laughs) Jesus is teaching us to pray, lead us away from that. Don't run towards it. So if we genuinely pray, lead us not to temptation, we learn to avoid those scenarios. We learn to just step back and like, nope, I'm not going down the candy aisle today. We don't trust in our own strength. Another way we'll live it out is we won't run to the temptations. We won't run down that aisle. Oh, lead us away, God. Oh, we're running down the aisle. No. If we genuinely believe that and pray for that, we won't run down that aisle. And we won't lead others down that aisle. We won't lead others into temptation. All these are a part of praying. Lead us not into temptation. Now the other side of this is that maybe God will allow you to go down the toy aisle. He's not tempting you, but he's allowing it to happen. So maybe like Job, it's a trial for us to go through so that we can come out stronger on the other end just because God believes that we can handle it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape so that you can stand up under it. Now, you can't take this first and say, Oh, then I can go down the toy aisle. No, you can't. God may allow something to happen. Maybe as you're walking down and he's leading us away, oh, They've got those stupid end plates that have all that desirable stuff, right? They know how to attract your attention. And they get, oh, I'll take that. God may allow it like he did with Job. And that wasn't a temptation. That was a trial. In Luke 22, Jesus told Peter that Satan was going to sift them like wheat through the trial of his death. That's not a, I didn't look it up, but I know that the meaning of that is not something that you want. It's not something that we would enjoy. But it was allowed to happen. And then Jesus told Peter, strengthen your brothers after that. It was something to meant to build them up. So it will happen. It does happen. Just because we pray it doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. It does happen. But when it is allowed by God, and it's not us doing the running to the temptation or the trial then there is going to be a way out. God is faithful. So, as Christians, our desire should be that God would lead us away from temptation and trials, but in the cases where he allows it, we trust him. We trust that he's offering a way out. We believe that he is faithful. So, we're going to do a a recap to wrap up part one. Prayer isn't so much about me and about what I want, but it's more about a time spent connecting with God and realigning, or as Ben Shapiro said, reorienting ourselves each day to be in and a part of God's will. It's a time when we release our name and our will and promote his name and his will. It's a time when we pray for our needs, but we also must trust him to supply those needs each and every day. We pray for our needs, not our greeds. We pray for God's forgiveness, which brings along with it the responsibility to also forgive others. And we pray for safety from temptation, but trusting in God that if we do face temptations or trials, it is to strengthen us, that he is faithful, and that he'll provide a way out. Teaching on prayer, I think, is one of the easiest ways for a Christian to walk away feeling guilty. And I think it's because we're aware of the need in our life that we could do better. We could spend more time praying. Oh, I missed today. 
we can, we, we're aware of that need. And so we feel that guilt right away. And I don't want you to walk away feeling guilty. I want you to walk away feeling encouraged, challenged to do better. We aren't focusing on, you got to pray this allotment of time every day. But praying is a lot like exercise. Five minutes is better than nothing. And you can't expect to like, oh, wow, my prayer life has been awful the last month. In fact, oh, once, twice, you know, where I really spent some time with God instead of just meal time. You can't expect to just, oh, I'm going to jump back in. You can't expect this huge divine connection every single time. But build yourself up. Five minutes is better than nothing. So don't walk away feeling guilty like, wow, I'm a failure. Walk away feeling challenged to do better. The disciples were seeking growth. Even as great of a relationship as they had with Jesus, they knew they needed to grow in this area. Teach us to pray. That's how I want you to walk away feeling challenged, encouraged. I believe that is all. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll turn it over to the worship team. God, I thank you so much for this teaching through Jesus on the content of our prayer. I pray that our desire would be what you want, just the same way Jesus prayed that your will be done, not ours. I pray that that would be our heart behind every time we pray and our attitude and that we would trust you for our needs and that we would trust that your forgiveness is strong enough to help us and enable us to forgive others. So God, I pray that you would have been glorified this morning. I pray that we could grow from this and um, as we go from this place, I do pray that people would see Jesus through us, that we would be lights and that we would be people who would bring respect to your name and that we would not dishonor it. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your blessings. In your name we pray.